I can't go out there and I won't say that stupid line one more time. I can't, I won't. In 1999, Galaxy Quest was released during a great year of cinema. That year, movies like Star Wars, The Phantom Menace, The Mummy remake, and The Matrix pushed the boundaries of special effects, while films like Sixth Sense, The Green Mile, Fight Club, Toy Story 2, and even Austin Powers 2 became staples of film to this day. Even the Blair Witch Project came out of nowhere and ushered in the found footage trend, which would later plague media in the future. South Park had its own movie, and it was truly a triumphant year for Hollywood with a great variety of tales that entertained artistic, mainstream, and niche audiences. There was something for everyone, and every month there were multiple films that resonated for years to follow. Galaxy Quest was also a shining star to add to that triumph for Hollywood. The film has quite a history in pre-production, and I highly recommend the documentary Never Surrender, as well as featurettes on the 2009 Deluxe Anniversary DVDs and later versions. The film was inspired by David Howard, who was a hungry screenwriter that pondered what it would be like to be Leonard Nimoy, forever known as Spock, and typecasted. His script was called Captain Starshine, and when the 1997 Men in Black film came out in theaters, studios were looking for science fiction movies to add to their rosters. The script for Captain Starshine told the story about a character, later played by Alan Rickman, who was a successful novelist and writer of science fiction, but craves the real thing. He begins experiments and somehow he finds a portal through time and space and he takes over an alien world and acts like Ming the Merciless. The oppressed aliens learn of Captain Starshine, who is analogous to the Tim Allen character you see in the final film. In desperation, the aliens travel to Earth to recruit the actor to save them from their oppressive ruler. DreamWorks picked up the script and then gave the project over to Robert Gordon to rewrite and reimagine entirely. In fact, DreamWorks told Gordon the broad strokes of the film and told him to write the project without reading the original script. At first, Gordon was reluctant and searched for depth in the film to inspire him, and then he thought of a scene where aliens believed in the actor so much that they revered him, and then the actor would have to tell these aliens that he was lying to them about who he was, and the film morphed into what we know today. DreamWorks wanted a Spaceballs-type film for kids, but Gordon wanted to make a love letter to Star Trek, and somehow, miraculously, it sneaked through the cracks of corporate studio execs to land on celluloid. To bring legitimacy to the film, the studio hired the legendary Harold Ramis to direct the film, but it would not last because Ramis had specific designs for what he was looking for in the lead. He wanted Kevin Kline to play Quincy Taggart, but Kline passed on the role to be with Will Smith in Wild Wild West. Then, Ramis considered Bruce Willis, Mel Gibson, Bill Murray, Steve Martin, Tim Robbins, and even Robin Williams for the lead, but they all passed on the idea. Alec Baldwin really wanted the role, and Ramis was behind that idea, but DreamWorks studio chief Jeffrey Katzenberg really pushed for Tim Allen and actually pursued Allen to take the role. Ramis, Katzenberg, and Allen would meet up, and Ramis wasn't feeling it at all. Ramis was worried about making a flop, and he did this once with Robin Williams in Club Paradise, and it haunted him. Ramis blamed himself for the failure of Club Paradise, and was known to have felt that he didn't translate Robin Williams' humor enough to make the film successful. And when he met Alan, he felt foreboding, as if the fate of Club Paradise was going to repeat itself if Alan was cast. This idea was so instilled in Ramis that when the studio pushed harder for Alan, 
Ramus decided to quit the production in February 1999. Ramus later stated how wrong he was about Alan after he saw the film. Three weeks later, Dean Parasol was the new director. Now, Parasol loved Star Trek, and he wanted to explore the fandom of conventions more. And he really wanted to make a good Star Trek episode inside this film. He wanted to copy what fandom was like and wanted to give the movie heart by making a Star Trek love letter. With the writer and director on the same page vision-wise, and only 10 months till the film's release, production began and it was a race to the finish line. When the film was finished, DreamWorks was disappointed. They wanted a Spaceballs film, but Parasol's film was more cerebral and more geared towards adults than kids. So the studio interfered by editing the film to tone down language and make it more kiddie friendly. The marketing was dead for this film as well. Not much was spent to promote it, as DreamWorks didn't understand the final vision. This was an audience film, not a child's film. One thing that came out of the promotional material was an awesome mockumentary that promoted the fictional show of Galaxy Quest. It was called Galaxy Quest 20th Anniversary. The journey continues, and it aired on E! Entertainment Television. This mockumentary would reveal that Gwen and Nesmith were once engaged. As far as I'm concerned, I've fed up with him. He seems very inconsiderate, but I have been really in love with him. I think we were engaged for a while, and I think I keep trying to start my life over, but I keep being thrown together with this guy. I will say, if you like Galaxy Quest in any way, you must watch the 20th anniversary show. It adds context to all of the characters and is a must-watch. It's easily found on YouTube. The film was released on December 25th, 1999 with a ton of other releases. During the same week, Girl Interrupted, The Talented Mr. Ripley, Any Given Sunday, Snow Falling on Cedars, and Man on the Moon were released. With all that competition, it was even worse when you took into account that there were strong previous releases like Sleepy Hollow, Bicentennial Man, Stuart Little, The World Is Not Enough, Toy Story 2, and The Green Mile still running strong. Galaxy Quest had an uphill battle to be successful. Yet something amazing happened with Galaxy Quest. During its first weekend of release, it made a healthy 7 million opening. Then it did something few movies do. It made more the second weekend and continued to stay on the top 10 for nine weeks. The studio knew they blundered the film, and with the right marketing, it would have easily made $100 million. This is evident because Jeffrey Katzenberg personally called director Dean Parasol and apologized for the failed marketing the studio arranged. At this time in my life, I had just moved to Nashville and was managing video stores, and at the time, I spent many months searching for my best friend in Jacksonville, Alabama. After finding him, instead of watching entertainment at his parents' house, we went to an old Carmike Cinemas outside Fort McClellan that I used to work at in 1989. The screen we saw Galaxy Quest in was completely dead with no one but me and my pal. Obviously, the theater mirrored the faith DreamWorks had for the potential of the film. The film starts right where the mockumentary started off, with clips of the canceled 1981 show in front of a fan convention. The Galaxy Quest fans are dubbed Questarians, and I want you to notice the enthusiasm this film places on its fandom, as it was a literal nod to the subculture of that era. Fans were often stereotyped as pimply-faced intellectuals that were often overweight, odd socially, and overly passionate about technicalities and details of their media. The nuance and details these fans would gush over for hours were the bread and butter of their conversations. Galaxy Quest captures this perfectly, 
and fans of franchises like Star Trek and Star Wars were anything but toxic. It was our communal safe space because young fans were often ostracized in schools for being nerds or outcasts, older nerds collected toys and costumes, and before the mid-90s this was kind of taboo where most adults were concerned. Fandom was a haven of inclusion and understanding. It was more of a celebration for loving the same thing, and it was awesome to experience. That didn't mean every fan or attendee was perfect, as the loudmouth bathroom guys attest, as they not only insult Nesmith's character, but everyone around them. What a freak show, man! Oh, this is hilarious! Bunch of losers! Begging for autographs at 15 bucks a pop! These two were unfortunately a foreshadow of the type of people who would later infiltrate fan communities and shun them from within with the help of the access media after 2015. We then go into the dressing room and it's important to note that Parasol felt it was essential the actors express their fear of typecasting while inhabiting these roles. Rickman was always being cast as a villain and tried to break out of that pattern with this film. Even Sam Rockwell, who was fairly a new actor, picked this film because he wanted to diversify his image after being in the serious Green Mile. Backstage, we finally meet the crew of the Intrepid. When re-watching the film, pay heed to the fact that Tech Sergeant Fred Kwan, played by Tony Shaloub, is always hungry because he's into pot and it's a running gag throughout the film. Shaloub originally tried out for Guy's part, but Rockwell got it. He was loosely based off David Carradine, who was rumored to do drugs when performing. Since Galaxy Quest was PG-13, they could not announce his drug indulgences, so that is why the constant food references are in the film for detail-orientated viewers to pick up. Shaloub is also very mellow and agreeable throughout the film. A perfect example is when the ship is damaged and everyone is panicking. Tech Sergeant Chen is just talking calmly, as if he is far out from any problems. He is hilarious after you begin to pick up these details. The ship is breaking apart and all that. Just FYI. Daryl Mitchell played Laredo and was in Parasol's previous film, Home Fries. David Alan Greer was also up for the part of Laredo. This character was a nod to Wesley Crusher from Star Trek The Next Generation. Jason was like a father figure. It was a lot of fun, you know, watching him and doing things. And we went fishing a lot of times and stuff like that. A few times he tried to use me for bait. The character of Tommy Weber grew up a child star and has some great moments in the film. The character is one of the few that doesn't mind the fact that he starred on the show, nor does he feel overshadowed by any of his fellow castmates. Alexander Dane was a thespian who was once an actor with promise but now was forever typecast as Dr. Lazarus who is supposed to have super intelligent and psionic powers. Now I wasn't sure that it was going to be for quite such a long time or indeed that um, 15 years on I'd still be talking about it but of course I'm Thrilled. Alan would joke when coming on the set that the captain was in the house and Rickman hated it. He said Alan couldn't take anything seriously and that he was an ass. Rickman used this for this character. Later, Rickman would accept and appreciate Alan's performance. Sigourney Weaver wanted to play Gwen and lobbied for the part when Parasol became the director. Though the studio frowned on sci-fi legends being in the movie, Weaver stated who better to be in the movie but someone who understands the genre. Sometimes I felt like, you know, sort of the camp counselor with a bunch of, like, toddlers. You know, kind of the practical one. Weaver loved playing a blonde starlet and said she felt her IQ drop every time she put the wig on and would even wear it at home. On June 2nd, 
Weaver wore her Gwen DeMarco costume during an Alien 20th anniversary screening and invited the cast from Galaxy Quest to join her. Then we come to Jason Nesmith as Captain Peter Quincy Taggart. This character was inspired from the rumored antics of William Shatner on the Star Trek sets. Well, you know, Jason's all right. He's just, uh, he kind of likes himself. I think he's a wonderful... Um, I don't think every show has to be about him, and I think sometimes he doesn't realize that. I mean, let's face it, for, I was carrying the show. The weight of the show was on my shoulders. Well, I think it depends on who you ask. In reality, Tim Allen was a huge sci-fi nerd who collects movie props for his own collection. He even bugged Sigourney Weaver to sign a piece of the Nostromo wall he had collected. Sigourney signed it, Stolen by Tim Allen. Love Sigourney. After Jason arrives, an argument erupts, and if you look closely, you can see an obvious dub made by the studio to cut language in the film. Unbelievable. You are so full of it, man. It's if you look closely, he clearly says, you are so full of shit, man. Some of Jason's vanity erupts when he comes to the stage and tries to take advantage of the moment. He begins to speak, but is cut off to his frustration, as his appearance is not a speaking event, rather, it's a meet and greet. Now, the film novel offers many insights in the character of Guy Fliegman. Obviously, the character was a spoof on the red shirt characters in classic Star Trek, but in the book it states that Guy really admires the cast, and it was his dream to be one of them. After joining them at the table to sign autographs, Guy is noted to be greatly appreciative of the group, even though no one remembers him for appearing in the show. Gwen even pats Guy on the back sympathetically when no one requests an autograph from him. Rockwell took the part of Guy after Kevin Spacey urged him to. He said he modeled Guy off Bill Paxton's character in Aliens. Also in the novel, Quan is asked very technical questions by fans about engineering, and he answers these questions with ease and savvy. Guy leans over and asks him, how does he know this stuff? And Quan says he made it up. The book also confirms the mockumentary's view that Jason and Gwen did have a relationship. To me, one of the best performances I ever saw in Tim Allen was this film. In the bathroom scene, when it hits him how his life has gone, listening to the idiot hate fans shows the range he brought to this film. His acting dominates this film, despite how Alan Rickman felt about him being a legitimate actor. Alan portrays aloofness, agitation. Now just listen on there there is no quantum flux. There's no auxiliary. There's no goddamn shit. You got it? Plagued with melancholy to finally facing reality. On our planet, we, uh, we pretend to, uh, to, to entertain. And, uh, nothing's wrong. I am so sorry. God, I am so sorry. All the while disguising his character with bravado, pride, and false confidence. I think this part was made for Tim Allen as he really allows vulnerability to seep into this character while lying to the world outwardly. What this scene really tunes us into is that Nesmith has really burned a lot of bridges with his fellow castmates, and he is an empty image that needs reviving. Thus this film portrays his arc to that goal, and it is set up perfectly in the scene which was actually based off of real-life events where William Shatner overheard people talking about him in a similar fashion. Get a life, will you, people? <laughs> I'm crying out loud. It's, it's just a TV show. <laughs> what is equally sad is Nesmith and his castmates seem to have similar fates. Nesmith lives alone in a mansion while Tawny and Alexander live in apartments alone. We also know that Fred Kwan is single because he latches onto Lalyra almost immediately. We also discover that Guy is living with his mother when he fails to woo a prospect 
just before the crew is transported to the Thermian space dock. But you live with your mother. Did Jason come through here? Yeah, he's, he's in there. Hey guys. The only person we don't know about is Tommy. For most of the crew, despite their fame, their family is basically each other, which is kind of sad and morbid. This only makes the narrative of the film better because this bond grows during the film, and it is because of this bond that they make it through the film together, and they are stronger for it. Now, the Thermians represent those over-eager fans who treat their media like it is reality. Dean Parasol was very open to actors' input and therefore loved when they added traits to the Thermians, and he encouraged it. All the actors did alien class, and their language was based off Enrico Colantoni's Mathazar. During his audition, Enrico had a lackluster screen test, and as he was about to leave, he suggested trying a voice, and it was the one that was used in the final film. His audition tape was actually used in other screen tests to see who could match his voice before Enrico even knew he got the part. The Thermians are completely innocent and naive, and that is the core of their race. They are completely ignorant of reality. They are like fans stuck in a fantasy world who have no idea how real life works, which plays wonderfully when Nesmith is looking for his shoes. The aliens have no idea where to look and stupidly gaze towards the ceiling as if the answer to his missing shoe will somehow manifest itself wherever they look. It is hilarious. Would you guys look for another shoe that looks like this, please? Yeah. Oh. Mathazar was the second in command of the ship as his commander was killed by Saris. He puts his complete trust in Nesmith to save them, even though Mathazar is truly the leader of his entire race by the end of the film. Missy Pyle played Lalyra, and her part was expanded because Steven Spielberg came on the set and pointed out that she was the only other female in the movie, and therefore needed larger evolution. This caused the love relationship with Tech Sergeant Chen to birth. The scream she makes is described as a baby in a bagpipe by her. The sound comes out of the transmitter like a, a baby in a bagpipe. <laughs> Patrick Breen played Quillock, who is a true acolyte of Lazarus and is a perfect example of a hero-worshipping fan in search of a father figure. His fate would cause one of the best scenes in the movie to occur, and Rickman's best moment, to be sure. It was Breen who came up with the idea of how the Thermians walked, which is comparable to that of a marionette. Also, Rain Wilson's theatrical debut was Galaxy Quest. Parasol wanted to give Wilson a larger role, but at the time, he was busy filming a TV pilot and was not available for this to happen. What makes Galaxy Quest so engaging is that despite all the humor, the film has very serious stakes. In fact, in earlier iterations, the film had more violence. Rathar Sarius seems like a cardboard villain. However, he is literally a genocidal pirate who is not only exterminating the Thermians and taking their resources, but it is also suggested that he is either raping or experimenting on the race's females. Yeah. I understand I got most angry. of the car. Saris is the bad guy, right? Oh, oh, yes, sir. He is a very bad man indeed. He has tortured our scientists, put us to work in the gallium arsenide mm -hmm. mines, captured our females for his mm -hmm. own demented purposes. An interesting thing to note is that after Jason arrives back on Earth, there was a concept where Brandon and his friends gathered in a mock studio with fake cardboard galaxy quest sets and they are disappointed that Jason never showed for their gig. The novel even states that they even rented a limo for him to come. After they hear that the cast is gathering for a store opening, they head there to see if they can rectify the situation. Whether this scene was filmed or not, I do not know. This also brings to question whether Brandon or one of his friends is loaded with money because renting a limo, an actor, is not cheap. My apologies. You know, evidently we had a little miscommunication regarding Voyage. You didn't show up. 
Another interesting tidbit that the novel reveals is that Guy is at the store opening because of Gwen. She invited him either by calling him or proactively inviting him in anticipation for being stood up by Jason. The reason she needed Guy there was that the cast's contract for the event called for five signers. This just continues to show Gwen's practical and supportive nature towards cast members. By Grabthar's hammer. What a savings. What a delivery. Alexander is seething over his situation and mirrors how many perceived Nimoy's frustrations in the 1970s. After switching items at the store appearance, Brandon's friends note that Jason dissed them again. Hmm. did it again. In the novel, one friend says maybe they should switch to Star Trek. Brandon is not fond of that idea. This moment parallels the dynamics between Star Trek and Star Wars fans at that time. A nice detail about Quan from this point on, wherever he goes, he is seen carrying his stash bag. Keep an eye on him in the future of the film. As you can note, he takes it almost everywhere, even on the barren alien planet. I think Quan used some of it recently because after this moment, He is completely unfazed, as if it's just another part of his buzz. What's wrong with him? I don't know. Come on. When seeing the ship for the first time, it is impressive to realize that the film is over 20 years old and has not dated that much. The set design is wonderful also, and practical, especially the bridge. It feels like a realistic environment. A funny note about the ship is that the designation is NTE, which stands for Not the Enterprise, because the film staff believe they might have copyright issues with Star Trek. Our first deleted scene has Quan tested with a technical issue in the engineering room during their tour of the ship. After years of making stuff up, the fellow castmates look petrified when Quan doesn't know what to say. Rather than panic, Quan goes to an engineer and asks their opinion so he can let them figure out the problem rather than him doing it. The scene was a nice touch to highlight how he can BS his way through issues for the rest of the film, and it works. It even works out better for Quan when the Thermians credit him for the answer. <sighs> He's got it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, of course, it's so obvious. Sergeant Chen, you're a genius. After Quillick is told by Alexander to refrain from referring to Grabthar's hammer, the deleted scenes continue. Quillick shows Lazarus his quarters, and when he asked where his bed is, spikes rise from the floor. Horrified, he asks where his toilet is, and Quillick shows him the most disturbing contraption that looks like something H.R. Geiger would imagine. It is a toilet, complete with spikes, tubes, and handles. The seduction of the crew to stay with Jason is actually very practical and fits each character. Jason is desperate to be a captain and to have meaning beyond fame. It is presumed that Gwen is actually still in love with Jason when taking into account the novel, the mockumentary, and their embrace by the end of the film. Alexander is typecasted and wants a role that is substantial, and Nesmith actually calls him out by saying this is the role of a lifetime. Quan is just going with whatever because he's spaced out. Guy clearly shows his motivation in the next scene. What? I was just about being on the show, man. Then there is Tommy. This is his true family, and where they go, he goes. After a nod from Alexander, Tommy is committed with the rest, even though the expression on Gwen's face is that of reluctant resolve. 
It also connects with every human's desire to do more than the routine programming of life, to mean something more. It is quite believable that they would stay at this moment in time, even more so to a fan of any franchise. I just want to go home. Say the word, we'll go home. Pay our bills, feed our fish, fall asleep in front of the TV, and miss out on all of this. At this point, 30 minutes into the movie, every major character is fleshed out fully, and it shows how intelligent the writing and direction of this film is. And it only gets better from here, but that will have to wait till the next conclusion of this video. Until then, happy questing. If you like what you see here, click like and subscribe.